It's nice to see this. You know, this guy's 1377, and he writes this uh, big history and a bit of geography and uh, philosophy and stuff like that. And why am I not impressed? Does 1377 seem kind of late to you? Well, you know, it's about a hundred years before Leonardo da Vinci, about a hundred years before, uh, you know, like uh, Bombelli and Cardano, 150 are inventing imaginary numbers, that's the square root of minus one. You know, like, uh, yeah, yeah, the guy was a, probably a pretty good writer, but, uh, you know, to consider him some sort of universal genius is uh, amazing. Jan van Eyck, the Renaissance is just around the corner, and it's not because of Ibn Haldun. Like, what, what did these bozos do with Ibn Haldun? Uh, Ottoman seized Constantinople, 1453, and according to him, that's what brought the Renaissance on. Jan van Eyck up in Holland is doing amazing things. If I if I got my dates right, before 1453, the printing press is already in the process of being refined by 1453 around Stuttgart, Germany, southwestern Germany. And he's saying, oh, it's because of all these Greek guys. They're, somehow or another, he managed to twist, and he's not the only one. It's almost everyone who's in religious studies. This was wonderful. The, the Ottomans, the Turks taking over Constantinople, the, Const the, the rump of the Byzantine Empire, because all these scholars who knew Greek and stuff like that went west to Italy and places like that. And say what? You know, Leonardo da Vinci, within about 40 years or so of that, of this, 1453, he said, I don't need the Greeks. He doesn't need that classical stuff. This is one of the main things that held Arabs back, and it held actually the Europeans back, is just copying Plato, copying Aristotle in particular, copying down Galen, you know, like uh, the, uh, he held back uh, the science of med medicine for thousands of years, really, or well over a thousand years, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So just copying these, you see, this guy says, they did uh, amazing original research, translating the Greeks, and I'm going, how was that original research? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's pretty well word for word one of his passages. <laughs> you know, it's funny. translation. I do translation. <laughs> I, know, right. hey, you know, I do original research. You know, I've translated Plato, but I actually have done. I translate the Bible. <laughs> Woo <-hoo. laughs> Jesus. The stupidity you get from people who are trained in so called theology, as he calls it, or religious study. Fall of Grenada. Oh my God. 1492. Here's about the first time he uses shameful. There's all sorts of blood and gore. People not surviving. The Jews got expelled from Grenada, right? So this was the last stronghold of the Muslims. And he says that's the shameful sort of thing. There's a long time ago. Lots of shameful things happened before and after. And an expulsion in those times was pretty darn good. When the Spaniards hit the New World, you know, there were lots of people dying in uh, in uh, Central America and stuff like that. Now understand they shouldn't have done that. It was stupid because the Jews would have been uh, many of the most learned people in the uh, Spanish Kingdom. And what happened is he, uh, he, he says, oh they were spread all over North Africa, the, the, the head of the Ottomans welcomed a bunch of Jews in. What he doesn't mention is a huge bunch of Sephardic Jews ended up in Holland. And the bottom line is, what country has treated those Jews consistently the best? Turkey? No. There are not many Jews left in Turkey now. And they knew. They better get out when the getting is in North Africa. Well, they just got ethnically cleansed in the uh, starting with the late 40s and the 50s and stuff like that. So this is how stupid the people in North Africa said, hey, the Jews have taken over traditional Muslim territory and what we're going to do is we're going to punish the Jews here and where are they going to run to? Oh, they're going to run to Israel! Right, and uh, further dispossess the Palestinians and, uh, you know, Christian and Muslim and stuff like that. That's how stupid this happened in Iraq. This happened in Egypt. Hundreds of thousands of Jews ethnically cleansed out of these places. You never even heard about it. You always hear about Palestinians getting ethnically cleansed by the Jews. And there was some ethnic ethnic cleansing in uh, 48. Did I say 47? 48.
Anyway, uh, Ottoman seized Constantinople. You know, uh, at least he, he does tell how they did it. You know, they had 60,000 men to 8,000 people inside of Constantinople. And it was a close run. That's lousy these guys were at that point in time. 60,000, 8,000 is a close run. But you know what actually won it for them? I mentioned it to you. You know, they got hold of cannons. And of course it was a native Ottoman invention. No, no, it was, they, uh, there was a dude called Urban from Hungary and that's kind of West sort of stuff, you know. And he tried to sell the cannon to the, uh, the, the people in Constantinople, the Greek Byzantines. And they said, hey, you know, we don't have enough money. And they didn't. They had no hinterland. All the land around them had been stolen by the Ottomans. You know that? Yeah. Stolen by them. And no hinterland. So, Urban, fine, upstanding fellow he was, he sold the cannon to the Muslims, the Ottomans. And that's how they used to breach these walls that had hitherto been unbreachable. So, yeah, it was, uh, you know, they wouldn't have been able to do it without, the Europe, without European firepower. Understand, that firepower is just a symptom of things. It was all sorts of things, naval technology, just organization, printing books, information spreading around that uh, gave uh, the so-called West its, its superiority. And I'm not talking about moral superiority, I'm just talking about actually being able to live in this world. Superiority that way. Amazing, amazing. Fall of Grenada, Safavid, dynasty of Persia, 1501. So, you know, like, it's, it's starting to fall apart. And he keeps on think, saying these are turning points. The real turning point is the invention of the printing press. And it didn't happen in the Ottoman Empire. It didn't happen in the Saf Safavid or Safavid Empire in Persia. It didn't happen in Egypt. The first printing press in Egypt, apparently, according to him, was at least one that stuck or something like that, was brought by Napoleon, 1798. The printing press is invented by 1450. You can't be behind the curve that far and expect to dominate. dominate. And that's the thing that really bugs the people in the Middle East. They can't dominate anymore. The big problem is the people who actually did the work, like the fighting, were the slaves. And all of a sudden they can't get fresh slaves. That was the first step. He doesn't talk about that, really. They can't get fresh slaves because the Europeans are saying, you're coming to Vienna in 1683? You're going back with your hindquarters in your hands because it ain't going to happen. It was a, a guy called, so that's one of the turning points coming up. But he doesn't understand. He's still going, oh, so if I have a dynasty of Persia, they were already r running into trouble a little after 1501. You know, it's supposed to be a big dynasty. What happens around uh, the next guy, Selim the Grim, F Grim, 1512, and I believe it's him. He's meeting them in Childeran. It's now in present day Turkey, but barely. The boundaries hardly changed since that time. And it's because of the Europeans. But what happens is, uh, uh, the Safavids are going you know, on horseback, you know, and uh, they, they run into the Turks and the Turks says, guess what we got from the Europeans, dudes? Come on, you're going to get a mouthful of lead, you and your horses. So it didn't work out so well for them, you know? So this stuff, uh, he talks about the gunpowder empires, and he's not talking about the Spanish. He's not talking about the, uh, he's not talking about the, uh, about the, any of the Europeans. He's talking about the Turks, the uh, the Mongols, or Mughals as they were called, in India. In India, And uh, I believe it's Persia or else the, the one in, uh, yeah, it'd be the, the one in Persia. So this is why the Mughals, starting 1526, this is the colonial era, were really able to not just imperialize, but colonialize India. They were using cannons against these poor Indians, you know, uh, who were just, you know, using conventional weapons and arms and stuff like that so you know this is part of European expansion then no one seems to understand it the expansion of the Ottoman Empire even into the eastern part of Europe was actually a European expansion same sort of thing with the Russians the Russians thought of themselves as straddling Eura you know Europe and Asia Eur Eurasian sort of thing the reason why they were able to take over so much these all uh, of the east but uh, all the way to Alaska is because they had these uh, European arms. You know, it didn't start with them. Selim the Grim, you know, who really gets the Ottoman Empire uh, going, and then Suleiman the Magnificent, who was his son, as I recall, 
so that's 1512 and then 1520 Suleiman Magnificent ruled for 46 years so he kind of benefited from the uh, the uh, the stuff that Selim the Grim did uh, spreading uh, the can I call it the gospel into uh, Europe and stuff like that second siege of Vienna we talked about that already 16 83 you know he talks about it as being a turning point no the turning point was 200 plus years earlier uh, you know like apparently someone tried to bring a uh, printing press into uh, uh, right after it was invented into uh, the Ottoman Empire and I think he escaped with his life but his printing press kind of ended up getting whacked so then the Saud uh, Wahhab pact 1744 that's a long time ago the Wahhabis and the Sauds have been uh, around a long time. It's a long, long time, and they've had this pact. And he talks about them being ultra-conservative. Eh, you know, like uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, a very conservative guy. Erdogan, a guy in power in Turkey, is a very sneaky kind of guy, but he's been supporting ISIS. Uh, recently, he, uh, <laughs> someone I know recently was saying, yeah, the head of ISIS just got whacked about two weeks ago, right? And uh, someone uh, we both know was saying, uh, you know, like, I wonder who did it. It must have been the, uh, who was he saying that turned, turned him in? Uh, the Kurds had turned him in. So it was in Idlib where he got whacked. I'm like, what are you talking about? The Kurds wouldn't know. They're enemies of ISIS. So this was about the last city, Idlib, that ISIS held. Uh, hopefully they're getting, people are getting rid of them now. But... Uh, I said, it's the Turks. They're their allies. And a long time ago, Baghdadi signed his death warrant by saying, I'm the caliph, that's a religious head of, and political head of Muslims all around the world. And Erdogan is sitting there in Turkey saying, hey, that's the last people who own the caliph that officially were the Turks. And that ended in 1924. It was rulership over all the Muslims, yeah. religious and, and political. So he's going, well, back, Daddy, you're going to get yours. Uh, and now, you know, it's their last city, and it looks as though they're gone. And Erdogan is saying, yeah, they're not much use to me anymore. I'm going to look like a good guy by turning him in. And they're, you know, like, after I, I said that over the phone, I'm checking the uh, news, and they're saying, the Kurds have claimed responsibility. Oh, yeah. My source was saying it was the Russians turning in. I believe it was the Russians turning in. They wouldn't know. But uh, an ally would, right? And, uh, but they were saying the Russians were claiming responsibility, the Kurds were claiming responsibility. And then, right near the end, this is the way news people are, they said the Turks were kind of claiming responsibility too. And I'm going, of course, you know, what they're doing is they're killing two birds with one stone. They whack this guy who's competition, and then they're trying to look at, hey, you know, we're an American ally. Never mind the fact that for the last eight years or so, they've been supporting him uh, tooth, nail, and tongue. So, him and his uh, buddies. Uh, let me see. This Napoleon invades Egypt, 1798. He was there for three years, and somehow this is supposed to be apocal. He was there for three years, and basically British sufferance. What happens is this is how far ahead the Brits were of uh, the French. The French go in the first battle against the uh, Egyptians. They lose 300 men. The French do, and they whack 6,000. Well, that's amazing. That's 20 to one. Not long after, the Brits capture Napoleon's, uh, well, they kind of uh, encounter Napoleon's fleet that had brought all his troops in, right? In Abukir, just outside of uh, present-day Alexandria. It still exists. It's still, you can still find it on the map. And uh, they're all anchored there, <laughs> these French uh, dudes. And they figure that they put all their guns on one side facing out towards the Mediterranean. And it's Horatio Nelson. He's going, yeah, okay, I think you guys are a little bit too far out from shore. I'm going to send half my fleet in behind you, in between your fleet and the shore. They got no guns there. <laughs> the French are getting blasted from both sides. Boom, boom, boom. So what are the, what are the, what are the killing numbers? 200 to 3,750. The killing, or 3,700, something like that. If my calculations aren't that far off, I think it's something like uh, uh, in the case of the French taking on the Egyptians, they've got modern arms and stuff like that. 20 to 1, the Brits are taking out the French at a rate of 17 and a half to 1. You see how superior the Brits were? 
to the French, and it was more just like brain power more than anything else. So uh, yeah, so the Brits could have taken over Egypt. Uh, uh, they, I'm sure, uh, registered some uh, resistance. But two years later, 1801, after they get rid of Napoleon's army, you know, they decamp. It's not like some greater power came and kicked them out the way the Brits kicked out the French. They got out of there, right? So this is a, a different sort of scene. When did the French uh, get into uh, 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 French invasion of Algeria, 1830? So that's a while back, uh, later. And understand, the uh, uh, Arabic claim to Algeria dates back to after 639 A.D. Uh, a Latin claim, i.e. French claim, to Algeria precedes that, about 600 years. So, uh, they, the Latin claim is not uh, foolproof. Uh, Berbers, Tuaregs, people like that, uh, claim to North Africa. And then Egyptians, like Copts. Oh, the Christians. <laughs> That's kind of politically incorrect, but uh, it's just the way it is. They've got a claim to Egypt. Anyway, murder at the Citadel. I don't think I've gotten that far in the book, but... In, East India Company in Yemen. Uh, so that's uh, England. You know, they really weren't big colonizers until other countries started to colonize. And then they're going, geez, uh, you know, we like trading. And if they're going to exclude us from trade, mm. you know, uh, it, it, the, I'm talking about this latter day so called colonialism. It was really imperialism. The uh, colonialism happened earlier, like here in the New World and stuff like that. That was different. People, especially in the United States, were settling, you know. Uh, and it wasn't just the Brits, it was, uh, you know, Spanish in, in uh, Latin America and the, uh, the Portuguese in Brazil. But that was earlier, you know. But the Brits really didn't, so he's talking, this is a big turning point. The Brits at the, near the mouth of the Red Sea, the Bab el Mandibus it's called, uh, they wanted uh, security that people wouldn't shut them out of access to the Red Sea. And so they took over Aden. How big a issue is that? You know how big Aden is? It's about less than nine miles by nine miles square. So there are cities that are in this world that are much bigger than that. Nine by nine miles square. So, yeah, you know, that's, uh, is that colonialism? I don't think so. I'm not, not setting a huge lack of people. Uh, let me see. Egypt, uh, Europe, and the Suez Canal. So Suez Canal, uh, built by the French, eventually taken over, uh, but not militarily, by the Brits, just by economics, right? The canal was a losing proposition. The company went into, in essence, receivership, and and part much of the company was owned by Egypt. So Egypt basically had to, that's when the Brits basically bought Egypt. <laughs> okay, you owe us this. What are you going to give us in return? But, you know, that's that's different from walking in. It's like I say, capitalists steal, there's no doubt about it, but everyone else takes up by force of arms. And the Brits did it. There are plenty of robbing, too. But they were a lot less inclined to do it than everyone else, including communists and anarchists and bozos like that. Discovering Middle East oil, uh, yeah, 1908. That's late, eh? Just a little over 100 years ago. And it was uh, Mesjed, what is the name of the place? Suleiman or something like that. Uh, kind of like in southern Iraq, southwestern Iraq. And it was the Brits who discovered it, and they set up British Petroleum, and now it's called BP. And those are the bozos that are responsible for polluting uh, the Gulf, down the Gulf of Mexico. Do you remember that? About Ten years ago or something like that. And then, oh, it's a, a little less than that. A little less than that. Then World War I in the desert, Lecture 5, so 1914. This is supposed to be a big turning point, uh, you know, like uh, the Ottomans picked the wrong side, and the wrong side morally, not just uh, strategically. Stupid, stupid fools. The Germans hadn't been major league imperialists there, but they'd been bad imperialists in South Africa. I think they basically kind of did a genocide on the Herero tribe in South Africa. You've never even heard of that, right? And that's okay. But uh, the Germans were particularly intolerant of uh, uh, people, uh, you know, it's not just Jews at home and stuff like that, they just, I should say the Prussians, right, <laughs> because there's, there, there was a lot of uh, enlightenment in Germany, but unfortunately they were taken over by Prussians, a lot of unenlightenment even in Germany outside of Prussia, and uh, so they picked the wrong side, and, uh, and then 
you know, the Brits have been supporting, they must have been getting sick and tired of it, supporting the Ottoman Empire. It was they were called the sick man of Europe, it had no business being in Europe. Uh, but this was like, uh, I don't know when they started, 1700 or something like that. This is 200 years later, and the Brits are still propping them up. And then they go to, uh, the, the Ottomans turn to, uh, to the Germans. And the Germans are saying, all oh, right, you know, like, uh, we're going to be taken over. We'll be moving our, uh, you know, uh, I think they're the ones that built the Orient Express and all that sort of stuff, you know, just to get their economic feelers in there. But it wouldn't end there. Then the last Caliph at Falls, 1924, uh, that's when the... Turks uh, got rid of their, their worldwide claim to uh, uh, dominance religiously and uh, stuff like that. So, um, here's uh, this kind of sums up this guy for me. You know, he's talking about 1492 and I'm getting rid of the Jews in Spain. The, the Ferdinand and Isabel, same year they sent Columbus. And he's saying, you know, it was sometime about 10, within the last 10 years or so. They gave the Jews who were expelled, the descendants of the Jews who were expelled in 1492, the right of return to Spain. And he said, I wonder when they're going to give Muslims the right to return to Spain. The you know, descendants of the ones that were. And I'm going, well, you know, as soon as the Muslims who are in Holland, who are treating Jews so badly, the Sephardic Jews or the descendants, of the Jews exile, ethnically cleansed by Ferdinand and, and Isabel, as soon as they stop picking on them so bad that you've got at least one politician and not a right winger. I mean, this guy's sympathetic with Jews. He's not some crazy, crazy, you know, he's not like Gert Wilders or something like that. He's telling, yeah, we can't protect you anymore. So maybe that's when, because you've let the Jews in 10 years ago, and then you let Muslims in. And the next thing you know, the Spaniards will be having to tell the Jews, you know, just like the Dutch, we can't protect you anymore. Yeah? You see how that works out? This guy is a total loser. Now, I'm not going to say don't read this book. Read this book. Get the series. Uh, but uh, understand, you know, like, don't take this as gospel truth. This guy's a bozo. I just wanted to show you this because it looks so beautiful. That's the ice in the glass.